Hello and welcome to the second talk in the 3 IE How-To series. This series provides a step-by-step -step guide to the production and use of impact evaluations. And this second talk is concerned with designing randomised controlled trials, or RCTs. What is an RCT? A randomised controlled trial is we randomly allocate the project, or what we call the treatment, to particular districts or villages or households or firms or schools or whatever, and randomly assign others to be in the control group. This is not the same thing as taking a random sample of those in the project and a random sample of those not in the project. We mean actually who gets the project is randomly chosen. So here's an example from a district in Kerala in southern India in which 30 villages have been chosen in the, distri in the district to be eligible for the program. Of those 30 eligible villages, 15 are chosen at random to be in the program and the remaining 15 act of the control group. That's a randomised control trial. So what are the steps involved in designing a randomised control trial? First, you define the treatment, including the eligibility criteria. Then you determine the levels of assignment and treatment analysis, and I'll say more about that later. You identify the eligible population, decide what type of RCT you're going to use, and I'll say more about those options later on. Write the analysis plan, Work out the required sample size using power calculations, not forget any subgroup analysis you want to do, and you'll usually find out that the RCT sample is less than the whole eligible population who are going to receive the project. Draw a sample for the analysis, and then assign that sample to treatment and control groups. So I'm going to pick out two of these eight steps. I'm going to talk more about assignment, treatment, and analysis, and I'm going to talk more about the different types of RCT design you could use. So what do I mean by assignment treatment analysis? The unit of assignment is the level at which we randomly assign the intervention. So we could randomly assign certain districts to be in the project and certain districts not to be, or certain schools to receive it and certain schools not to. The unit of treatment is the level at which the treatment is delivered. The unit of analysis is the level at which we analyse the outcomes of interest. So let's see three examples. The first example comes from China a programme in rural schools providing vitamin pills to children to tackle anaemia and so improve learning outcomes. 60 schools were identified as eligible for the programme and 30 of those randomly chosen to get into the programme, the other 30 is the control group. So the unit of assignment is the school. In the chosen schools, every child receives the treatment, the vitamin pill. The unit of treatment is the child. And then we're analysing the anaemia status and the learning outcomes of children in project schools compared to children in the non-project control schools. So the unit of analysis is the child. In the second example of preschools in rural Mozambique, 70 villages were identified, 38 of those chosen at random to receive a preschool, and the remaining 32 go into the control group. So the unit of assignment is the village. Villages are chosen to receive preschool. And the treatment is the village, because the preschool goes to particular villages. The unit of analysis, however, is the child, because looking at the cognitive and social development gains of children in villages with preschools compared to children in the villages without the preschools. The final example comes from Gujarat in India, where a program looked at the regulatory mechanism for controlling industrial pollutants from plants in Gujarat. They identified 473 plants for the study, of which 233 were randomly assigned into the treatment group, the remaining 240 serving as the control group. So 233 got the new regulatory mechanism, whereas the remaining 240 were subject to the existing regulatory, me regulatory mechanism. In this case, the unit of assignment is the plant, the unit of treatment is the plant, and the unit of analysis is also the plant, because we're looking at plant level emissions. Now, depending on the unit of assignment, and treatment analysis, an RCT may be either a simple RCT or a cluster RCT. A simple RCT is one in which the unit of assignment, treatment analysis are all the same. That will often be the individual or the household, but it could be the firm, the school, or so on. In our three examples, the industrial pollution in Gujarat is an example of a simple RCT because the plant was the level of assignment, was of treatment, and of analysis. As an example of a cluster RCT, in which the unit of assignment is a higher level than the unit of treatment or analysis, meaning any individual cluster 
which we're assigning to, contains several units of treatment or several units of analysis. An example of that is the China Anemia study, in which the score was units of assignment, but each score contains many children who were subject to the treatment, and many children who were subject to analysis. That's an example of a cluster RCT. And development interventions will most usually be amenable to cluster RCT designs. So, what possible randomised control designs are there? I'm going to talk about five, which are not mutually exclusive. The first one is a pipeline design. In a pipeline design, you don't randomly allocate units to treatment or control. You randomly allocate the order in which they receive the intervention. This design can be used when the intervention is anyway going to be rolled out over time, which is very common. And so we randomly assign units to the year in which they're treated. And those who get treated later on, say in the last year, act as the control group for those who get treated earlier on, say in year one. An example of this design is the Progresa Oportunidades Conditional Cash Transfer Program in Mexico, which started in the mid-1990s with just over 600 rural communities being chosen for the program, and they were randomly allocated into three groups. The first group to get it in year one, and the second in year two and the third in year three, and so the impact evaluation used those getting the program in year three as the control group for the first two years of the program. Here's a pictorial representation of such a design where we have 60 eligible villages for the program. We've randomly picked 30 of those villages to get treatment in year one, shown by the blue triangles, and the remaining 30, shown by the red squares, get the program in year three, and so act as a control group for the first two years of the program. The second type of design is a raised threshold design. A raised threshold slightly changes the eligibility criteria to create oversubscription. So there are more units eligible to go in the program than you're actually going to put into the program. So you randomly pick from those eligible units who comes in the program, the remainder acting as a control group. An example of this comes from a vocational training program in Colombia. There are around 147 training centres around the country, and for each course they run, they get around 100 applications. What they normally do is identify the top 25 applicants to admit. So the evaluation team said to them, don't identify the top 25, identify the top 30. And of those 30, we'll randomly pick 25 to go into the programme, and the remaining five will act as the control group. So this design has made virtually no difference to the intervention design. They still get 25 people being admitted. Those 25 come from the top 30, so they are mostly the same people. And 70 people get rejected. So you've made virtually no difference to the intervention design, but you've managed to create a valid RCT impact evaluation. Similarly, if an organisation plans to count an intervention in 30 districts, they should instead identify 30, 60 districts in which they would be willing to operate, which may require relaxing the eligibility threshold somewhat. Then of those 60, they randomly pick 30 to carry out the program, and the remaining 30 act as the control group. The third type of design is matched pairs, which can be used with, for example, a pipeline randomization. When we carry out any impact evaluation, we want to have good balance which means that the baseline characteristics of treatment and control are on average the same across all the variables we have information on. By prior matching, we can reduce necessary sample size to have sufficient power and help achieve better balance. Suppose, for example, we have 30 eligible villages for the program, which we're going to randomly pick 15 to be in the treatment and 15 to be in the control group. Now, suppose of those 30, two are larger than the others or two are fur closer to town than the others, or two have some predominant ethnic group, which is not found in the other villages. Now we simply picked 15 at random of these 30 villages to be in treatment and 15 in control. It's not at all unlikely that the two larger villages would both end up in the treatment group or both end up in control. The two villages closer to town would both end up in treatment or both end up in control. So our sample would not be very balanced, and it's quite possible we'd see a different outcomes between treatment and control, which was not a result of the intervention, is a result of lack of balance. So what we do with a matched pair design is match the sample into pairs of similar villages based on observable characteristics. Then in each pair, we randomly assign one to be in the treatment group 
and one to be in the control group. And that prior matching helps obtain a better balance between the treatment and control groups. The fourth possible design is to have multiple treatment arms. We don't need just to have a treatment arm and a control arm. We might have three arms with a treatment arm A, a treatment arm B with a different treatment, and then a no treatment control arm. We could have more arms, but the more arms you have, then the larger the sample size required. And we don't have to have a no treatment control arm. You might have a control arm that has some treatment. For example, it's often the case that the control arm actually gets the existing practice. In the case of goods regarding industrial pollution, the control arm was subject to the existing regulatory mechanism. This is often the case in medical RCTs in which the control arm gets the existing standard of care. So what we're examining is how the new medicine or intervention or policy works compared to the existing policy or intervention, which is really the policy question of interest. A special case of multiple treatment arms is the factorial design. In a factorial design, treatment arm A gets a particular intervention, for example, agricultural extension services. Treatment arm B gets a different intervention, for example, a seed subsidy. And treatment arm C gets both an A and B together, so we can test the complementarity hypothesis. And again, of course, we could have a fourth untreated controller. The final design is what's called an encouragement design. An encouragement design can be used for interventions that have already been made available nationally. So there's no possibility to randomise the interventions, and that's not what we're going to do. Normally, universal schemes are not universally adopted. So take the example of an agricultural input subsidy. Perhaps only a quarter of farmers have taken out that subsidy. So when we randomly pick a treatment group and a control group, before we do anything, we see that in both treatment and control, a quarter of each group have taken up the subsidy already. And when we look at average income between treatment and control, we find the average income is 200. It's the same in both because we randomly assigned treatment and control have the same average characteristics prior to the intervention. Now, the intervention is not the subsidy. The intervention is, a, is an encouragement to take advantage of the subsidy, such as more information about the subsidy, about the benefits it can provide. Once we provide the encouragement to the treatment group, but not to the control group, we observe a differential take-up rate between treatment and control. So now when we see a different income between treatment and control groups, 240 in treatment and 200 in control group, that difference comes because of differential take-up rate. So we can ignore in our analysis the top 25% already adopted in both groups, and we can ignore the bottom 25% who are never going to adopt neither group. That difference comes about because of the difference in income between the new adopters in the treatment group who have been encouraged to take up the intervention and those other half of the control group who still have not adopted because they've not been encouraged. So even though the intervention has already been rolled out nationally, the encouragement design allows us to get an estimate of the impact of the intervention itself without randomly assigning the intervention. So in conclusion, there are many different types of RCT design. So it's really very likely you're going to be able to find an RCT design that's suitable for intervention. And many of these designs don't have any implications for the design or implementation of the intervention. If they do, they're really quite small. The encouragement design has no implications at all. The pipeline design simply alters the order in which some of the treatment units get the treatment. And the raised threshold design simply alters at the threshold the eligibility criteria of those eligible to receive the program. And so when designing an ex-ante impact evaluation, you should always first think about whether a randomised control trial is possible. So thank you for listening. Please do go on and do the quiz associated with this talk. And I hope you'll go on and listen to the other talks in the 3IE how-to series and encourage your friends and colleagues to do the same.